Welcome back to another week on the Catholic Toolbox, the art of practical Catholicism. I'm your host and founder, George Manasseh, here as we keep you with practical tools for living Catholic faith in our modern world of today. And uh, we are definitely praying for the repose of Her Late Majesty Elizabeth II and uh, our former monarch, and God save the King, our new King Charles. And um, in light of the period of mourning for our sovereign, here in Australia and around the Commonwealth, we are brought to reflect on the whole concept of monarchies in general uh, it, it, with respect to our faith. So I was thinking about it many weeks ago, and that's, and I mean, nobody came to mind better to discuss the topic than Dr. Robert Haddad. Welcome back to the Catholic Toolbox. Yeah, thank you, George. Happy to be here to discuss this topic. I think it's a timely one. Um, and I'm looking forward to it. Excellent. <clears throat> so let's go straight into the topic of the, the actual title of the topic, which is the divine right of kings. So has, I mean, many, this is a very controversial one as well. Many people believe that kings have a divine right or, or God wills it or some reason. But, but the title can be very confusing for many people who don't know what it is. So run us through, what is the divine right of kings? Well, to put it simply, the divine right of kings as understood in, say, say basically from the 16th century onwards, is not a legitimate Catholic concept. Whether we're monarchists or not, it's a distortion of authentic monarchy. Um, let's basically go back to a fundamental principle. Uh, all authority comes from God. And that is whether in the church or in the state. But there's no one sanctioned form of government, uh, meaning democratic, aristocratic, monarchical, there's no one form of government which has been mandated by God that we must have as a civil society. So kingship is really a human institution, but the authority that kingship or queenship wields, that authority comes from God. But the key thing here to note is that there are limits to the authority of the state and the church. They have their domains, they are legitimate, they are sovereign in their domains, they should not be interfered with, but they do not, they must not in turn extend themselves beyond their realm and interfere in any other domain. So the state should not interfere in the running of the church, and the church should not claim the immediate power or authority to run the state. And that's something we, we learned over the years, <laughs> very importantly, throughout when we had church and state as one. And, and what problems did that cause? I mean, having church and state as one, well, to, to bring down to a nutshell, what was the problem in having the church and state together for our listeners? Okay. Well, ideally, in an authentic Catholic sense, there is no problem uh, because let's look at it from this point. When Christianity became legal under Constantine and the church had the freedom to operate, what is the church doing? It's converting people to the true God, to Jesus Christ. So individuals are converted. When individuals uh, have an authentic conversion, they change. If the vast majority of people change in a society, then society would necessarily change. Okay, so uh, as the citizens become more Christian, the, the culture, the society will become more Christian and Christians would enter into government and Christians must govern according to Catholic Christian principles. So um, in a sense, you do get, uh, if you were in a Christian state, in the ideal situation, the Christian state um, must be Permeate, permeated by Christian principles and the rulers 
govern according to the laws of God. And this is the unity I think you're mentioning or you're inferring in your question. Uh, but the problem arises when one of the authorities, whether it be in state or in church, purports to act beyond its realm and to interfere in the other realm. Uh, at the same time, I think we should touch on, not right now, but before we finish tonight, touch on the concept of separation of church and state as a modern understanding, particularly in the United States. Excellent, excellent. So, I mean, I think that's clarified for us there. But let's, um, let's reflect on civil authority to start with. Is it of God or should, should, should the church have as much yield as much power in most of our civil life <laughs> well, uh, uh, let's say a little bit more beyond the moral or, or being controlled things that can get mm. get out of well, hand civil to answer your first question civil authority is from god how now st thomas aquinas gives us the understanding of the how um basically human beings are social beings we, we can't all live as hermits, some can, but ordinarily we live in society. And government necessarily grows from that. A need, there's an inevitable need for order and government when society arises. So in that sense, government and the authority that government should exercise is natural. And that's how it comes from God. So um, right, that answers your first question. Again, should the church be interfering in the government of civil society? Well, that's, that's the question we have tonight to answer. It should influence. But when you look at who governs the church and who does govern the church, the Pope and the bishops united to him govern the church. Should they also govern the state? No. Other men, women, ordinary lay people, so to speak, they govern the state. But according to what principles? Well, if they're in the ideal of a Catholic Christian state, as we used to have, you know, in the high Middle Ages in particular, they should be governing according to Christian principles as baptized Christians themselves. And this is where the church gets involved. If those leaders are not ruling according to Christian principles or purporting to act ultra vires or beyond their power and purporting to usurp the church power, well, that's when the church gets involved to discipline, you know, secular rulers or civil rulers. I like to use the term civil rather than secular because secular means today, not of the world, but without religion, okay? Yeah. Uh, and we saw that in the Middle Ages. We saw emperors, we saw kings who were subject to the authority of the Pope and disciplined um, Henry IV and the Holy Roman Empire in the 11th century and his struggles against St. Gregory VII because the, Henry IV wanted to usurp the power of the Pope to appoint bishops in the Holy Roman Empire. We've seen, um, uh, trying to remember here exactly, Henry II in England excommunicated for the murder of the Archbishop of Canterbury, St. Thomas Becket. Okay, we've seen uh, Henry VIII, we saw Elizabeth I, they were excommunicated. Uh, for their schism and heresies and persecution of Catholics in England. And other rulers over the centuries, if they divorced and remarried you know, against the teaching of the church, the Pope would issue an interdict. This is the authority of the Pope at its highest. The Pope isn't claiming to now rule in the place of these you know, wayward kings or monarchs. The Pope is saying, when the Pope issues an interdict, that the 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 Subjects in that kingdom are no longer obliged to obey that king, are no longer obliged to obey their oaths of allegiance or to pay taxes. And that just pulls the rug out from under those monarchs. <laughs> but the Pope does not then take upon himself the civil authority, but would want to see someone else raised in the, in the place of that wayward monarch to exercise the civil authority. So what you're saying is that the Pope yielded the power to place an interdict upon a king 
who was publicly not acting with immoral grounds or in the interest of the people and fighting for justice or any other cause there. And that could further guarantee that the monarch, that the monarchy itself would always remain virtuous in, in governing, uh, governing the particular land, land or realm. Well, so, it, should have, it should have been. It was the way to keep civil authority within certain, uh, you know, parameters. But of course, what we've seen, particularly from the Reformation onwards, was the success of civil monarchs in overthrowing the authority of the Pope in their realms. And what they normally did, uh, they aggregated the power that the Pope would have had or previously, previously had upon themselves. We saw that in England, you know, with Henry VIII onwards. And then later on, you know, from the 16th and 17th centuries, we saw this, you know, reservate or this power grab, right? The monopolization of power, both in church and state, in the English monarch, culminating in, you know, Elizabeth II, James I, who succeeded Elizabeth. And then later on, we saw it in France. Okay, in the time, in the gradual, gradual aggregation of power, centralization of power in the French monarch from Louis XIII, climaxing with Louis XIV, and you know, the, uh, what was called Gallicanism, this attempt to you know, exercise authority over the church in France directly by the French king, uh, as opposed to the Pope in Rome. And of course, we've seen so many instances of it since. Um, Napoleon, the French Revolution, Napoleon, and now today, secular states today have basically reduced the church's civil power to virtually nil. Um, and that's the problem with secularism today, that not only does the church have um, no power in the state, but has no influence over the minds of people in society. And anyone who attempts to put forward the church's position on any issue, moral, social, ethical, economic, they're normally marginalized, excluded, or told to be quiet, stop imposing your views on the rest of us, you know, stop wearing your religion on your shoulder uh, and keep your opinions quietly to yourself. And, and we, we, we prefer that you go away. That brings me to the question of what is the limit of civil obedience? Is there a limit to it? Because mm. I, I remember a time where uh, I was younger and had a reversion back to the faith and and, um, and I'd say, you know, uh, I have a funny saying to my friends, you know, if it's, if it's, if it's not divine law or it's not canon law, I don't care. Mm. Well, there are two. Well, I'll give you a reference to two scriptures here. You know, Jesus has asked the question whether we should pay taxes to Caesar. He's handed a coin. It's a Roman coin. It has the image of the Roman emperor on it. And our Lord responds by saying, well, give unto Caesar that which is Caesar's and give unto God that which is God, belongs to God. Yeah. So pay taxes to Caesar. We're obliged to. OK, um, but there's a limit. Give to God that which belongs to God. So the state can over uh, in it reach itself by demanding prerogatives or you know, exercising authority uh, in, in areas that are no go zones for them. So that we are we are obliged ordinarily to obey the state. I'll give you another quote here. Romans 13, one verses verses 1, 5, and 6, if you give me a moment to read it, let every soul be subject to the higher powers, for there is no power but from God, and those that are or are ordained by God. Wherefore, be subject of necessity, not only for wrath, but also for conscience's sake, for they are the ministers of God. So who's St. Paul referring to here as the ministers of God? The Roman emperor, the consuls, the local governors, uh, the procurators, uh, the generals, the, the law enforcement officials, the courts, etc. But they are all pagan. They are heathen. Um, exactly. And you know, they are idolatrous. But St. Paul is saying they have a legitimate authority. Obey them, but there is a limit. 
we must obey God rather than men. Another famous quote from St. Peter in the Acts of the Apostles. So there is a limit to our civil obedience. Uh, and for many, that's quite clear. Okay. So, so yeah. where does the limit extend? What's the criteria for the limit? Is it that if something definitely contradicts the moral law or divine law? Mm. Mm. Apart from those two, is there another prudential way to discern whether or not we're going we're going to obey a particular law in a particular well, area, apart from moral grounds and looking at it whether it contradicts the divine law? Yeah. Well, let's look at um, you know firstly the moral law. Okay. Well, let's talk about us as informed Catholics who know something. So mm -hmm. if the if the state is asking us to do anything against the Ten Commandments, we can't go there. If there are laws they pass that contradict the Ten Commandments, like divorce and remarriage, like abortion on demand, like same-sex marriage, then we, okay, we must resist the implementation of those laws. But when we fail, as we have been doing repeatedly over the recent decades, etc., then we uh, we regret that those laws are in place, and we don't we make sure that we continue to live faithful Catholic Christian lives and never exercise you know, you know, or engage in any activity in line with those, you know, immoral laws. Um, the, a case in point, a good example we have is from the time of Henry VIII and the example of St. Saint, Thomas More and uh, St. John Fisher. These two saints, they, they resisted uh, a, a king who overreached himself, who made himself not only the monarch of England, uh, but also head of the church in England. So he usurped outright by law, by an act of parliament, um, the authority that the Pope has, and only the Pope has over the ecclesiastical government, over the church in England. And so what were good Catholics meant to do in that situation. They were meant to deny the king that usurped authority under, you know, under conscience uh, and under, the, under, under pain of death. And that's why they are good moral examples for us. Excellent, excellent. Let's go into the divine right of kings. Mm. Uh, when we think about it, 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 before we go straight in there, do you think monarchies, this may be your personal opinion, I'm not trying to tap, uh, tap whether or not <laughs> into whether or not you are a monarchist or not, and I'm a monarchist, uh, <clears throat> but do you think it's a better form of government, uh, system of government, uh, which reflects the divine realities? Mm. And does oh, it yes. possibly live better justice than, let's say, a republic state? Mm. Well, to repeat myself from what I said earlier on, there's no actually divinely instituted form of government. But I think monarchy does best reflect the form of government in heaven. Now, we can't have government on earth exactly like it is in heaven, though we do pray in the Our Father, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we're meant to on earth somehow reflect you know, the kingdom of God in heaven upon earth. Yeah. I am a monarcha, monarchist at heart, but I'm a constitutional monarchist. So I say that because I believe there must be checks and balances in society. And we saw that happening back in the days of King John and, you know, Sherwood Forest and you know, Robin Hood. I mean, that's based on a true event, you know, the Magna Carta. The Magna Carta, that was the fruit of an uprising against oppressive, uh, oppressive monarchy that sought to, um, again, aggregate authority, more authority than it should have upon itself, and go, go against the principle of subsidiarity, usurp the authentic authorities that lower bodies had down the you know, civil hierarchy. So, yes, I'm a monarchist. I, I believe in a constitutional monarchy. And by constitutional monarchy, I also believe that we should have a constitution that reflects Christian principles. And so the parliament which has an authority, prime minister, ministers, members of parliament, two houses of parliament, they should never be able to pass laws that would be against the law of God. 
And that would be guaranteed by having a constitution that reflects the laws of God. So they would not be able to pass laws uh, that we, the type of laws we've been seeing in the last few centuries, etc., that have brought in, you know, a moral degradation. Um, so we don't live in an ordered Christian state anymore. I'm just thinking what we want is is a balance it is about a pure balance of power by having a government there that is completely independent from the monarch and the monarch is is neutral and doesn't get involved in political matters or take sides being an unelected official who's glorified with material wealth does that somewhat guarantee doesn't guarantee really in an earthly sense but does that further minimize the risk of corruption and um, does the monarch help to assist the nice balance uh, that we have there so let's say you have a corrupt government in place you have the monarch who can dismiss the entire government does it help to pr provide some kind of a nice balance and accountability mm -hmm. there as a system well, of government i would say so i don't want i don't believe in monarchies that are just figureheads I don't believe in monarchies that are that have no power. I don't believe in monarchies that are just reduced to mannequins for the fashion houses of of Europe and the West. I don't believe in monarchies that are just provide photographs, photo opportunities for paparazzi and scandalous stories, you know, for cheap magazines and newspapers. I don't like that type of monarchy. A monarchy should have power. And it's part of the checks and balances within a society. So, yes, the constitution should embed powers within the prime minister and the ministers and the elected government. And there should be checks and balances coming from the monarchy, as we do in Australia. The, uh, the governor general and the local state governors have reserved powers. They don't exercise them often. I mean, John Kerr did in 1975 and was very controversial, but powers to dismiss a government that, you know, is reprehensible. And that was the term that was used in 1975 for the Whitlam government. But um, yeah, and at the same time, there are checks and balances on the monarch's power so that we don't end up in tyranny. We don't end up, you know, with uh, uh, any monarch who's usurping the rights of other levels of government and the rights and authority of the church. So I think we've got to be careful here with another expression, you know, the um, separation of church and state. Um, that's also like divine right of kings, um, a term that is uh, pregnant with distortion or error. Um, we do believe in a form of distinction between church and state. And that's what we've been talking about so far, a distinction where the, the Pope and the bishops have their realm of authority and the secular government or the civil government has their realm of authority, but they, they inform each other. The, the, the Christianity and its teachings inform the members of the government and therefore their policies, their laws. But the state also has an obligation to protect the church. And that's how it was in the early Middle Ages, in the time of Charlemagne, for example, when the Holy Roman Empire was founded. There was no separation of church and state, but Charlemagne ruled the state and the Pope ruled the church. They worked together, supporting each other. There was no separation, but there was clear distinction. The idea of separation of church and state is a uh, modern enlightenment concept and it has its foundation in thomas jefferson and the foundation of the american republic um and you know and and since and onwards since then and so it's an ingrained aspect of american political life but that's not that's not how it's meant to be either the idea that the the separation is of a nature so that uh the church and its teachings, the gospel and its principles cannot influence the state. You can't have prayers in public schools. You can't have government funding for religious schools. That's the consequence of separation of church and state in the United States. Um, 
etc. So yeah, I, we must also oppose this type of concept. But advocating, yes, uh, not separation, but distinction and preserving that distinction. Now, what came to mind now was uh, Quas Primas regarding the sovereignty of Christ the King. Now, the mm. Second Vatican Council spoke about religious freedom. Do we? Do you see any contradiction there? Do we? Did we sort of sell out our civil rights and advantages in society at the Second Vatican Council? Mm. Well, we've had a lot of controversy regarding the religious freedom um, issue or question arising since the council. Can I mention, I'll answer this point of yours, but I just want to mention one other document that goes back many centuries earlier, back to 1302, and it was Boniface VIII and his encyclical Unum Sanctum Ecclesia, yeah. One Holy Church. And in that, he said that the Pope has the right to judge anyone, including kings. And that earned, earned him the wrath of Philip IV of France, and and it resulted in in Boniface VIII being physically assaulted by the emissary of him, Philip IV, William Nogaray, with an iron glove being belted across the head of that pope, and he died three weeks later. Yeah. That principle yeah. really is still valid. The pope does have a right to judge all the baptized including those who are kings. And if they operate in a manner which uh, tends, uh, goes against the faith, the, the law of God, the gospels, the rights of the church, well, they can be judged. We've already discussed that point. Then you go to Quas Primas. Yeah. And um, was the it Quas Primas? Or, Qua, what, yeah, Quas Primas, 1925, uh, less than 100 years ago, Pius XI established the Feast of Christ the King. Mm -hmm. And that was during the time of the Mexican Civil War, the Mexican Revolution, the persecution of the church. And Relevant that timing. Yeah, that's right. And, they, and the, you know, the, the, the Mexican uh, Catholic fighters, um, the, just Cristeros, as they were called, they had as their battle cry, Viva Cristo Rey, and you know, long live Christ the King. And yes, that encyclical didn't crown Christ as king. It just recognized a reality that Christ is king, king of kings and Lord, Lord of lords, and that he is the king of everyone in the universe, whether they acknowledge that or not, whether they believe in him or not. That is an objective reality. And he sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, as king and Lord of all creation, et cetera, et cetera. Now, then we have the Second Vatican Council, and the document on the religious liberty, and how do we look at it? Um, does it contradict previous teachings on religious liberty of the church? And that's a huge area of controversy, and I really am reluctant to go down that path. I do say one thing. Um, a state, in ideally, ideally a state should be Christian Catholic, and it should be, you know, um, recognizing the true God, the true religion, practicing that true religion and defending and promoting that true religion. For me, that's a non-negotiable. At the same time though, and this is where the tension point exists, each individual within that culture, that society, they can't be forced to worship the true God or Jesus Christ yep. because yep. then it's just, it's not real, it's not valid, it's not authentic, um, it's not acceptable in the eyes of God. We must come to the true God, Jesus Christ, the true religion, freely and lovingly. We can't be compelled, we can't be forced, we can't be deceived, we can't be persecuted, we can't be you know, threatened with death to come to the truth. Okay, So there is a sense of, of authentic understanding of religious liberty. People should be uh, given the freedom to come to the truth. They must freely come to the truth without force cons or cons coercion or threat or deception, etc. Okay, But does religious liberty within a state extend to giving individuals the right or power, authority to undermine the Christian state? And the answer to that question must be an emphatic no. 
otherwise we end up where we are today. We are where we are today with no Christian states anymore in the world mm -hmm. because, you know, the enemy in inverted commas succeeding through overt or covert means as individuals or collectives to bring down the Christian states that once existed in the world. So there's no right of freedom for error, no right of freedom to propagate error, no right of freedom to undermine a Catholic Christian state. But at the same time, there's the individuals should be free in coming to the truth. And again, to repeat myself, free from force, coercion, deception, etc. That's the tension point. Um, so I don't believe in, um, I do believe in laws that would prevent people spreading error and restraining them from doing so. But I don't believe in arresting, torturing, imprisoning or executing people because they refuse to come to the true religion. Absolutely. So, All right. yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's as much as we can cover on that area uh, there. But let, let's continue in. Uh, where does this... Pre so you mentioned before that the, the Divine Rod of Kings is a Protestant concept. It became, yeah, I would say that. I think it's fair to say that because, you know, Henry VIII, Elizabeth I, James I, they aggregated the authority of the Pope to themselves. And then they began to claim that they are king by the ordin ordinance of God and they have therefore a divine right to be king and to rule not just over the state but over the church that is the distortion that is the grave error is that what the divine right of kings claims mm. at its heart that is the great error of the concept of divine right of kings kings have rights they have an authority that's divinely that originates in the divine in god yeah, absolutely. By but virtue it, of the fact that all authority comes from God. That's Not right. That uniquely divine will that God wanted them to be in place, in power, and their succession. Because mm. it, humanity, the nature of humanity, the nature of humanity is a social being, the need for humans to live together. What grows out of that naturally is the need for government. That comes from God. So government authority comes from God. So whoever holds that authority, whether it be a king or a queen or an aristocracy or an elected democratic government, Republican government, whatever it is, they possess legitimate authority. So they have a divine authority and a divine right to exercise that authority but within limits. And this is what the divine right of kings, this is where it falls down as a concept. It did not place limits on the monarch. So the monarch became a tyrant. That's why you had the English Civil War of the 17th century, for example. I mean, not that I supported Cromwell and his, and his forces by no means. If I lived in his day, I would have probably, yeah, I would have sided with Charles I. Um, against Cromwell, um, because Cromwell had other evils, uh, particularly his anti-Catholicism. But um, yeah, so we as Catholics do not accept the term divine right of kings as understood in from the 16th century onward. Though we do, we should be at heart monarchists, yep. but monarchists yep. that have limits, monarchs who have limits to their power and authority. So what you're basically saying is that we as Catholics cannot accept the divine right of kings principle. Simply no, because it places no limits on the power and authority of the king. What's quite shocking is that it asserts that the king can, ha uh, can rule the church and appoint, uh, uh, does it say that it can appoint uh, bishops or the uh, the monarch can appoint bishops for the church. Yeah. Well, That's right. it... no limit on the authority of the monarch in how the monarch uh, governs the church. Of course, later on, obviously, like you look at the periods of Edward uh, post uh, 
Henry VIII, he was only a boy. He had no competence to, to make any decisions with respect to the church. But the regents who ruled in his stead, they certainly had a lot of power and authority in determining um, the governance and the worship and prayer book you know, Book of Common Prayer of the Church of England. And later on, Elizabeth obviously didn't have theological competence. So she would, you know, be delegating to the various Anglican divines to make sure that the Church of England remained somewhere between Protestantism and Catholicism while persecuting Catholicism terribly. Um, so, you know, um, we don't want tyrants. We don't want a situation where no one has rights against the state. And we've seen how this ugliness developed from in the in the 20th century. You know, the divine right of kings. Yeah, we overthrew kings, but then we what did we put in their place? Tyr governments, tyrannical governments, dictatorships, which were far more destructive of church and society and humanity. Um, when we just look at, you know, Nazism, and when we look at Soviet communism, we look at Chinese communism, we look at other revolutions in, in Mexico and Spain, et cetera, et cetera. So those were authorities, those were governments, likewise, who placed, who ag aggregated all authority upon themselves, uh, and denied any other, you know, party, movement, level of government, individuals with rights against the all all omnipotent state and humanity was far worse off as a consequence okay i, I think what's the catholic position on the divine right of kings the catholic position to sum it up is that kingship monarchy is a legitimate form of government and monarchy uh, has its realm of operation within the civil realm. Uh, it, though there must be checks and balances, the monarchy must respect the rights, power and authority of lower levels of government. This is what we call subsidiarity. Must not usurp the powers of those who are working at the local level or any intermediate level between the local and 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 the monarch, and of course, must not usurp the authority of the Pope and or bishops to govern the church and should be governing the state according to Christian principles. That sums up what a Catholic position should be with respect to monarchy and or really any other form of government. I'm going to crown you king. Uh, uh... Dr. Robert Haddad, and give you a system to design of government. Run me mm. through in, in a few minutes what that would look like. If I, you, I crown you King of Australia and, and you're all, your, all the states and realms of the Commonwealth yeah. of Australia, we want yes. to make it an ideal Catholic state. Okay. Well, in my coronation ceremony, I will be crowned king either by the Pope or his delegate. Say <laughs> it was Australia, the president of the Australian Bishops' Conference, okay? <laughs> so that would be sending the message that I acknowledge that my authority to rule in the civil realm comes from God. Now, this is what Charlemagne did in the year 800 on Christmas Day. He was crowned by Pope Leo III. Why? As a message to all and sundry, that he acknowledged his authority came from God. Unlike Napoleon, later on, just over a thousand years later, when he's about to be crowned as emperor of the French by the Pope at the time, let me get it right, which Pope was it? can't remember if it was Pius VI or Pius VII. Uh, he grabbed the crown off the Pope and he crowned himself. So in doing that, Napoleon made the statement, I am emperor by virtue of my own power my own strength not derived from god or any representative of god so firstly coronation ceremony will be sending a message that i acknowledge that my authority comes from god and inherent in that there are limits okay i will in my coronation oath i would be uh, making it clear that i'm defender of the faith 
and I am propagator of the faith. So I will rule in accordance with Christian principles and to defend the rights and prerogatives of the church. I would have, there will be a constitution in place that would give powers to me vis-a-vis uh, -vis parliament, the prime minister and the ministry. Uh, and there'll be checks and balances there. But also there'll be constitution which that same constitution would outline in detail, like, like our current constitution does here in Australia, section 51, what, what, the, what the federal government can legislate on and therefore, you know, negatively what it can't, what it has no power to do. And the old would, would work to ensure that that constitution would protect the integrity of the state as a Christian state. Yeah. And that I would expect the prime minister and his ministers or her ministers to always be governing in accordance with Christian principles and in accordance with the constitution. I would veto any law that came across my desk that would be, you know, against the law of God, the law of Christ, the law of the gospel, the law of the church, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, whether I would survive long as king in my current circumstances is <laughs> a debatable point, but that's the ideal. Because you need to be courageous to be that type of king. Imagine the opposition that would arise today if, it's, if suddenly, you know, that was planted in the Australia, in the now, in the, the current condition of people and their mentalities and lifestyles today. But we're talking about the ideal. Um, and I would make sure that my moral life uh, reflected the gospel, that I would not be a scandalous monarch. I would not set the bad example. I would not be a playboy king. I would not be divorced and remarried. I would not be unfaithful in marriage. Um, you know, and I won't be just a mannequin for the fashion houses of Europe or, you know, a photo opportunity for the paparazzi. I would actually, in, I'll be giving speeches. I'll be, and in those speeches, there'll be always something that promotes the higher ideals of, you know, life, virtue, honor integrity um you know what we what we don't have today what we've lost the sense of reverence the sense of awe the sense of wonder the sense of majesty the sense of hierarchy the, and the sense of service because power exists to serve now i remember you made a comment maybe about half an hour ago about being a monarch loaded with a lot of money mm -hmm. um well that's not where the power of the monarch really lies. You don't want to be seen as a monarch loaded with a lot of money and, you know, and, and not serving the nation because then you're just seen as self-serving yeah. and you're giving fuel to revolutionaries. Um, you know, you're just, you're just a self-serving individual. Uh, you know, what white privilege as they say today, yeah. you know, um, you know, and the, the Marxist type of thinking, but if you're going to be wealthy, that's not a sin in itself, but you've got to be seen to be uh, uh, using that wealth and power that's God given to serve the common good, uh, not self-serving, serve the common good, that monarchs exist to create a society that be that's most conducive to getting people to heaven. That's, that's the bottom line. And what would your relationship with the church be? the ecclesiastical authorities and how would how would you what would be the relationship uh, i know there'd be some kind of separation between church and state but what how would you design yours well i wouldn't be i wouldn't be in the position of you know appointing bishops in my own realm i know that's a prerogative that belongs to the uh, pope i would not be you know compelling local bishops conferences to gather in, you know, councils or synods that uh, attempt to change church doctrine, uh, as some states are doing today, some, you know, national bishops' conferences are doing today. And by the way, those national bishops' conferences are dying churches, just accelerating their dying process. Are you talking, so, about, are you talking about Belgium or Germany? Um, you can say Germany, Belgium, Luxembourg, yeah. the Netherlands. 
Um, you know, anyway, that's another topic. But I, if I if I had a national bishops conference going down that path, um, you know, I'll be in communication with the with the Pope as soon as possible for an intervention. And if one wasn't to come, then it gets tricky. Then it gets very tricky. Uh, because, you know, as a civil authority, I'm here to support the church and to support authentic church teaching. But when you've got a wayward church, how do you respond? Well, what I'll be doing, I'll be making sure that I give a lot of uh, airplay to orthodox bishops and none to heterodox bishops. Excellent. That's, that's the first thing I would do. That wouldn't be interfering in the church directly. A, but a, yeah. Sorry. Uh, does a good Catholic state have an obligation to promote and propagate the faith uh, on a civil level uh, by funding yes. or any other means as per uh, Quas Prima? I, I would say definitely yes. Um, you know, the taxes that states collect, that, that's not money that belongs to the government. That's money that's given to the government. That's people's money given to the government for the sake of the common good. And if the citizens, if it's going back to the ideal, if the citizens, if the subjects, it's not a republic, so we use the term subjects, not citizens. If the subjects are Catholic, then the government has an obligation to support Catholic projects, Catholic ideals, et cetera, et cetera. And that would include primarily Catholic education. You know, so that Does would be the first. a good Catholic state have an obligation at the same time to suppress or, or not support? Let's say we can't suppress people's freedom to practice other religions, but to but not you, engage in supporting or promoting other religions than that of the true religion of Christ. That's true. Now, the, there is a tension point here, but the, I can see a clear way forward. You know, the, the state can repress heresy. And it can repress heretics from actively publicly promoting their heresy. Yeah. In the same way we repress drug dealers promoting, you know, their drug trade. Um, but what people do privately in their own homes, in their own hearts, well, that's where the state should have limits. Uh, we can't then arrest people and torture them and force them into the truth, as we stated earlier. So this is the concept. That's what developed in the Middle Ages, the controversial ghetto concept. Now, that's not a good thing. It's not a good word today. When we talk about ghettos, we you know we normally talk about uh, hideous abuses, particularly in the Second World War with the Jews, etc. So in the Jews in the med medieval times, well. That's another topic in its own right and very controversial with a, you know, a number of very sad stories. But uh, it was seen as the way forward by Christian states um, not to exterminate the Jews. I mean, that's a hideous, abominable idea, concept, crime. Um, but, you know, to restrict Jew Jews in certain parts of in a large cities where they would be free to practice their religion, but not allowed to pr propagate their religion. I guess it was the same for Islam in Spain in the conquered territories after 1492 and Isabella and Ferdinand. Um, we have to respect people's natural rights, um, but we also have to protect the Christian society. And this again is the balance. Um, you know, so, Religious freedom, uh, people are free to follow their conscience, but they're not free to propagate objective error. And this is the tension point that governments... Now where does you know, the freedom of speech come in with, in line with your views? Yeah, well, this again, this is an offshoot, isn't it? So freedom should we not allow people to still speak their error or make their errors known? Um, but we shouldn't promote it, actively promote it or give them funding, Or, uh, uh, but we, we shouldn't suppress. See, it? for me to get to say anything publicly, um, you know, advocating the repression of 
freedom of speech on the grounds that error has no rights is would is an anathema for today's mindset for today's mindset and i can see why people would find it a frightening thought a frightening idea that any person's right to free speech could in any way be limited or curtailed or quashed because we've seen nazis fascists communist states engage in that and and the hideous consequences um and you know conservatives are very fearful today of any leader who talks in any sense about you know limiting free speech i mean all these revolutions of the enlightenment and post enlightenment era were about free speech mm -hmm. and i want free speech but i want free speech for truth and error if error is gaining the ascendancy in any region because it's been allowed to propagate and the consequences are deleterious for society uh for individuals as it was for example med medieval period albigensian heresy you know for a couple of centuries there in southern france and northeastern spain the albigensians had the ascendancy and the tri their local triumphs meant had radical consequences for society and individuals in those parts of the world. And um, so that wouldn't have occurred if their free speech was curtailed on the grounds of the common good. Because the other issue we have today is that people don't believe in an objective truth. People don't believe in a true religion. And if, and if there's no objective truth and no true religion, then there's no right to, you know, propagate, defend, or you know repress in the name of objective truth or the true religion and this is the triumph of postmodernism today postmodernism advocates the view that there's no objective truth even if there was we can't discover it our senses and our intellects are unreliable um, we create our own truth your truth is equal to mine and vice versa and if we can create our own truth we can create our own identity, hence transgenderism. Um, and no one has the right to repress any expression, any thought. And um, and that's the dilemma we're in today. And we're living the consequences of it. Is it reversible? Naturally speaking, I can't see how it can be. You know, um, Can we ever go back to how it was in the mid high middle ages? I can't see that happening naturally. Let's go into three. This is where this is where we're going to go straight into some three practical tools this week on the Catholic Toolbox. Mm. How can we take action to restore remnants of what was good in Christendom? We have to in, insist on the existence of objective truth, and we have to proclaim that and develop arguments in support of that. We have to. And the first thing before we even do that is to um, convince all and sundry that our senses are reliable. We got five external senses. We can see, we can hear, we can taste, we can touch, we can smell. We get information through our senses. That's reliable. That's true. We can, we can, we have an intellect. We can form concepts. We can understand. We can articulate what we understand. So we must restore, from an anthropological perspective, uh, an understanding of humanity and its powers and the reliability of those powers and the discoverability of the existence of objective truth and the discoverability of objective truth and the ability to live that truth. That's what the ancient philosophers were doing before Christianity. But with Christianity, we know that we can't live that objective truth by ourselves because of original sin. And, and so we need to make people aware also of human weakness and the need to rely on another power to live the truth. And hence, that's where Christianity comes in. Thanks. So that's that would be my starting point. Um, you know, we have to advocate for the existence of truth. And therefore, behind that, advocate again for the existence of god and the rational arguments for the existence of god which are there 
and which are unchallenged despite the claims of the atheists and the new, new atheists who really just attack and destroy caricatures or straw men of these arguments. And then they sing and dance celebrating this victory, which is really over straw men, not, or not the um, arguments of a St. Thomas Aquinas, for example. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. So I think uh, there's a lot for us to take action in trying to restore our society um, and, and, and understand governance a little bit better in light of God's will, um, God's will and God's providence. So thank you very much for being with me, uh, Dr. Robert Haddad. It's an absolute pleasure. And likewise, it's a pleasure for me and uh, it's an honor to be on your show. And I just want to congratulate you for the great work you do. We all are small, we all are weak, and we all do little things, but all these little things count. And if everyone who's baptized Catholic uh, did their little thing, society and the world would certainly be a better place, without a doubt. Absolutely. So take action with your little thing and uh, your little bit to society. And that's a <laughs> absolutely beautiful way to put it. I mean, we all leave the world a little bit better by contributing that little bit. But thank you very much. If you're tuning into the Catholic Toolbox, if you want to download the podcast, go to thecatholictoolboxshow.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to subscribe to our weekly podcast alert by going to the website and putting your email in there and uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel and everywhere else on social media. Till next week, God bless, take care and take action.